It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, today 817,000 more students are now impacted by the chaos this government has created in our province's education system. With no EQAO testing, parents and students will lose out on this important assessment that lets them know how they're progressing in class. The absence of a report card comments will likewise keep parents in the dark, and that's just the beginning of this strike action. The education minister said parents shouldn't be put through this uncertainty, but I remind you, Mr. Speaker, it is this government that has created this uncertainty through their flawed negotiation process. Premier, the education minister can't get the job done and she won't step aside. Will you fire your minister of education and this chaos for Ontario parents and make sure the children get the full education they deserve? Mr. Speaker, please. Mr. Speaker, please. Thank you. I, uh, I may have to reenact my original uh, Thursday issue. When I stand, it stops. No shots. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Education is going to want to comment, but uh, let me just say, Mr. Speaker, that we want uh, very much for. Uh, the uh, teachers, the support staff, the students all to be in class across the province, no matter what board, no matter what region of the province, Mr. Speaker. Um, obviously, I'm, uh, I'm encouraged in terms of the elementary uh, students in the public system that they, uh, they'll remain in the classroom, and I'm pleased to see that ETFO has returned to the central table, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, because the only way to get a deal is to uh, be negotiating. And, Mr. Speaker, we do believe in the collective bargaining process, and that is a, that is a real difference between between us and the, uh, the party opposite. We believe that the collective bargaining process should be allowed to work, Mr. Speaker. There is a new process in place that recognizes that there is a central process Answer. and local, Mr. Speaker. That was necessary in order for us to move forward, and we look very much forward Thank to getting you. those deals at the table. Supplementary. <laughs> well, uh, Premier, uh, not only are the 8 817,000 elementary school students impacted, there are still nearly 72,000 students locked out of their classrooms. This government needs to think about those students for just a minute. Think about the Brock High School rugby team in Cannington, yeah. who have practiced so hard all year and now may not be able to complete at OFSA, compete at OFSA. Think about the grade 12 student from Sudbury, who's been practicing all year for a senior solo at a farewell concert that may never happen. Think about the student at St. Clair Secondary School in Whitby, she needs to be in her calculus class as she tries to prepare for an Ivy League education. Premier, make these students a priority. Fire that education yes, minister so these students can get back to work, back to school. Yeah. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. I do think about those students. That's exactly what I think about Absolutely. when I think about how important it is that we have a world-class education system in this province, Mr. Speaker. And that is exactly why, Mr. Speaker, it's very important that we have a process in place that allows us to work with our teacher and support staff partners, Mr. Speaker, that we get a deal at the table, that we honour the collective bargaining process, Mr. Speaker. That's very important to the relationship between uh, all of the adults involved in the education system. I'm not happy with the fact that there are kids out of school, Mr. Speaker. I'm not happy at all about that. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, I got involved in politics mostly because of the 26 million student days that were lost because of the previous government's inability to have a partnership with the education sector at all, Mr. Speaker. So we are absolutely committed to making sure that the yes, collective sir. bargaining process works, partaking of that, Mr. Speaker, and continuing to build up the, the best you. education system in the world. Again, to the uh, Premier, students are being used as pawns in a process that this government Mr. has created. Tourism. It's now obvious that no one seems to even know what the rules are, Mr. Speaker. When both the education minister and the leaders of teachers' unions make conflicting comments about what's an issue at the central bargaining table and what's an issue at the local table, is it any wonder that a settlement is nowhere in sight? Premier, for 16 days, Durham students have been without an education. For 11 days, students in the Rainbow District have been without an education. For six days, Peel students have likewise been denied an education by your government. 
Now, with over 800,000 elementary students impacted by your two-tier train wreck of a bargaining system, Order. it's clear the education minister is not up to the job. Once again, I ask you to do the right thing. Fire that get negotiations going and get the kids back in the classroom. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Uh, you can ignore me all you want at your peril. Premier. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, obviously, we share the concern of everyone in this chamber, from all three parties, that there are students out of work or out of out of out of school, and we want to support those students. But what I would point out is that we are committed to the collective bargaining process, and Durham, where it is a local strike, there are. Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. EGFO, the elementary teachers, the elementary teachers have returned to the table, and discussions are continuing. And that's how we're going to solve the problem is by negotiations, and negotiations are going on. But we are very concerned about those students, uh, particularly those secondary students who are out of class. And it's packed. On Friday, I met, from the the Carlton and the Deputy Ontario, I met with the uh, Council Sir. of Ontario Universities, we, and we've met with the boards repeatedly, and we're working to put in to make sure the internet courses are there to support. New question, the member for Renfrew, Nicholson, Premier, Premier, our guest this morning, Premier Coyard, has taken real strap steps to balance Quebec's budget. Yep. Premier Wynne's budget balancing plan involves a fire sale of assets that belong to the people of Ontario. Furthermore, Premier Coward has shown leadership with his province's energy policy. Yep. He understands that low hydro rates are fundamental to create a climate where business can, pr can prosper and families can thrive. You, on the other hand, are intent on bankrupting Ontario's businesses with your government's energy policies, forcing them to flee this province and set up shop elsewhere just to keep operating. Premier, will you take a lesson from Quebec about the direct relationship between low hydro rates and keeping businesses here in Ontario? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. All right, so we'll apply it. Next one, when I'm standing and I get quiet, somebody wants to interject, they're named. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I neglected at the beginning of the, my first answer to congratulate Patrick Brown on his uh, on his uh, yeah. leadership win this weekend, Mr. Speaker. Um, having been through a leadership myself, I know that uh, I know that he must be very excited and uh, anxious as he goes into uh, these coming weeks. So I just wanted to congratulate him. And um, the uh, the member opposite. Reminded me because, of course, he touched uh, the new leader touched on uh, on the, this issue in his remarks, Mr. Speaker. And I um, I know that the member opposite understands. And when we talk leader. about the relationship with Quebec and we compare and contrast uh, our uh, our realities, Mr. Speaker. I know the member opposite understands that we have different geography than Quebec. I know he understands that. I know he understands the Answer. tilt of the land is different in Ontario than it is in <laughs> Quebec, Mr. Speaker. But we certainly will work with. Quebec to do everything we can to make sure that we maximize our partnership. Thank you. Supplementary. Ontario's Estrada Cop removed its operations to Quebec, in large part because of the competitive hydro rates in that province. This past month, Goodyear chose to open a plant in Mexico instead of Ontario because of our ridiculously expensive hydro rates. Ontario needs businesses to come here because of our hydro rates, not to run away because they can't afford them. Your government's failed energy policies have already cost this province over 300,000 well-paying manufacturing jobs. Yep, all gone. Premier, how much longer will you ignore the exodus out of Ontario of solid job creators like Goodyear before you take real action to lower Ontario's hydro rates? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the member will know that in Northern Ontario we have a NEAR program, which is an industrial support program that takes 25 per cent off the uh, price uh, of manufacturing facilities in Northern Ontario. Mr. Speaker. 
And in Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, we have among the lowest rates, industrial rates, in North America. Mr. Speaker, the new leader of the Progressive Conservatives Member from talked Timmons, about James Bay. Basing, basing our energy policy forward in building new hydroelectricity capacity in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we've used that all up. There's no more capacity. We spent $2.6 billion, Mr. Speaker, expanding the the member from the and Carleton, second time. The member from Lanark. Carry on. We spent $2.6 billion expanding the autogamy hydro yes, dam. We spent $1.2 billion building a new tunnel to expand Niagara capacity. Thank Mr. you. Speaker. Final supplementary. Thank you very much. Back to the Premier. Quebec has embraced the fact that a prosperous province needs to have a strong private sector economy. An economy that allows governments to invest in its people rather than sell off public assets to buy labour peace. Quebec wisely chose to build its energy system around its strength, a natural abundance of hydroelectric power. You, on the other hand, insist on subsidizing expensive wind and solar projects that are costing Ontario families and businesses thousands of dollars each year. Speaker, today the Premier touted Quebec's accomplishments. Premier, Will you follow Quebec's lead and adopt a realistic, affordable, provincial energy plan? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, last month Ontario's manufacturing sector gained 1,200 new jobs. We saw the manufacturing sector gain over 800 jobs the month before, Mr. Speaker. Since 2003, our government has announced over $1.6 billion in support of Ontario manufacturers, leveraging over $15 billion from the private sector to spur, in, spur innovation. Mr. Speaker, we are also among the lowest in North America in terms of industrial pricing because of our programs that we have, such as the ICI, IEI, which lower significantly the prices that our businesses have to pay, Mr. Speaker. Your, your question, the leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Let me first uh, congratulate uh, Patrick Brown on his election as leader of the uh, Progressive Conservative Party of uh, Ontario. I also congratulate the other members that participated in the, the, uh, the race for leadership. <laughs> speaker, not a single, oh, my, my question is to the Premier Speaker. Not a single person in Ontario voted to sell Hydro One. And now the Premier is refusing to hear from people about what they think of this short-sighted scheme. More than 28,000 people have sent this Liberal government a message that selling Hydro One is wrong. Ontarians don't want to pay the price for yet another bad decision by the Liberals. They want the Premier to stop her privatization scheme before it's too late. Why is this Premier refusing to listen to Hydro Question. One's owners, the people of Ontario? Well, Mr. Speaker, as the leader of the third party knows full well, we ran on a platform of building this province up, Mr. Speaker, and a, and a cornerstone of that plan, Mr. Speaker, is investing in infrastructure. And a cornerstone of the plan to uh, be able to uh, come up with the dollars, to come up with the funding to do that investment, Mr. Speaker, was that we were going to look at the assets owned by the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, owned by the people of Ontario. And we, we said that clearly in our budget, we said it clearly in our platform. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party knows full well that they ran on the same assumptions. And in fact, she said just on May 7th, and I quote, so there is no doubt we did talk in our platform about looking at some of the physical assets the province owns, unquote. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the, the third party, Hamilton I think East she Stony knows Creek. that it is very important that we invest in the roads and the bridges and the public transit that are needed in this province, yes, Mr. Speaker. We can't do that if we don't have the funds to do it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And that's why we need. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, a physical asset is not a hydro system for the province of Ontario, and this premier should know that. She has scheduled four days of hearing, Speaker, on the Hydro One sell-off four days, and not a single one of those hearings is going to be held outside of Toronto. Hey. Selling Hydro One will hurt forestry and mining in the north. It will hurt farmers in our agricultural heartland. It will hurt manufacturing, our innovation sector, and small businesses across this province. It is going to kill jobs and make life 
less affordable, more expensive. It will hurt families, Speaker, in every single part of Ontario, and people deserve to be heard. So, why is this Premier refusing to hear from the people who will pay the price for her wrong dead set had a decision to sell Hydro Question. One? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, First of all, let me just correct the uh, leader of the third party. She knows there are six days of uh, committee hearings, Mr. Speaker, that are uh, that are happening. Well, Mr. Speaker, she also knows that the discussion she also knows that discussion of the amendments of a bill are part of the committee hearings, Mr. Speaker, and so that is why it is six days of hearings, Mr. Speaker, that are happening on the on the bill. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that if we do not invest in the transit and roads and bridges that are needed in this province, Mr. Speaker, then we will hobble the ability of this province to move forward. We will, we will not ensure the growth and the economic viability of this province, our competitiveness globally, if we don't make those, uh, make those investments. So, what we are doing, Mr. Speaker, in terms of opening up the ownership of Hydro One, retaining 40 percent ownership, Mr. Yes, Speaker, keeping regulatory and price controls in place, we're working to make that a better company, Mr. Speaker to work better Thank for you. the people of this province. Final supplementary. Speaker, perhaps the Premier's House Leader should send her a copy of the motion that's before us that we're debating today, which says four days of hearings, two days of clause by clause. Every day, more people are sending the Liberals a message that selling Hydro One is the wrong decision, and they won't they don't want to pay the price for it. This is one of the biggest decisions in a political generation, and the Premier is shutting people out. The Premier talks about transparency. Oh, she talks a lot about transparency, Speaker, but she's only holding four days of committee hearings. She talks about openness, Speaker, but she's ramming this short-sighted plan through this legislature like a Harper-style omnibus bill. If the Premier is so proud of her plan, Speaker, and thinks that people actually support it, why why is she so worried about giving people their say through hearings across the province? Question, thank you. Mr. Speaker, I am, I am very confident that in the six days of committee sitting, and I understand that I understand that two days are clause by clause, but Mr. Speaker, I spent a lot of time in committee, and it seems to me that committee, the discussion that happens in clause by clause, is extremely important because that's where the synthesis of what has been heard gets expressed in amendments, Mr. Speaker. So I hope that the, I hope that the leader of the third party is not suggesting that clause by clause is irrelevant, because that is when the bill gets analyzed every clause by clause. So I would just much better. Thank you. Go ahead. In terms of the conversation that we have had with the people of Ontario, North, Mr. Speaker, North. I would remind the leader of the Sir. third party that there are pre-budget consultations across this province, Mr. Speaker, no, Windsor, London, Toronto, Mississauga, Cambridge, Ottawa, across the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question, the leader of the third party. Also for the Premier, Speaker, while the Premier might believe her own spin about broadening ownership, but people see through it, Speaker, and they know that selling Hydro One leaves them paying the price. I was in Brantford this weekend listening to people. Laura Duguid owns a bakery. Hydro heats the ovens and runs the air conditioning during the summer. She says that the higher bills that she's going to have because of the sell-off of Hydro One could mean that she will not be able to hire employees and, in fact, may have to lay off. It is clear that selling Hydro One is bad for small businesses. Why does this Premier, what does she have to say to the people like Laura Duguid who have small businesses and don't want you to sell off Hydro One? Well, Mr. Speaker, what I would say to businesses across the province, to uh, residents and ratepayers across the province, Mr. Speaker, is that we are, we are in the process of making changes that are going to put downward pressure on rates, Mr. Speaker. We're not interested in rates going up. We are interested in a more efficient, a better company, Mr. Speaker, that is actually going to help the constituents of this province, Mr. Speaker. And in terms of people having their input, there has been much opportunity. There will continue to be, as I said, in the six days of hearings, Mr. Speaker. And I would remind I would remind the leader of the third party, Mr. Speaker, that under the NDP in 91 and 92, there was one day of committee consideration for the budget, Mr. Speaker. One day. And we have got six days, Mr.
finish, please. Just to remind the leader of the third party, Mr. Speaker, that we are yes, putting sir. in place ample opportunity for people to uh, delegate. Mr. Speaker, it is not just small business people who are going to pay the price. Kim Prince and her husband are barely making, making ends meet as it is. She is distraught and she is angry. Kim says that if her hydro bills keep going up, she and her husband will literally, literally be on the street. Now, what does the Premier have to say to people like Kim Prince and her husband who can't afford to pay the price for selling off Hydro One? Premier. What I would say to uh, people across the province, including in Brantford, Mr. Speaker, is that we must invest in infrastructure. We must invest in infrastructure in every region of the province. We must make those changes, and those changes will help individuals because it will help them to get home sooner to their families, to get to work, Mr. Speaker, in a much more efficient way. And it will also help businesses, Mr. Speaker. The one thing that business says to me, particularly businesses that want to come to Ontario or want to expand, is they need investment in infrastructure. And I understand, Mr. Speaker, that the uh, member for Timmins, James Bay, he has said that their plan would be just to borrow more money, Mr. Speaker. They would just keep borrowing, Mr. Speaker. They have no other plan, and, Mr. Speaker, that's not viable. That is not a tenable solution. There must be a multifaceted solution. That's the plan that we've put in place, Mr. Speaker, so that we can make those investments that are so critical to the businesses and the individuals in this province. Final supplementary. Speaker, nobody voted in favour of selling Hydro One because this government was not upfront about the fact that they were going to do that during their election campaign, and they know it. It is the wrong decision for businesses. It is the wrong decision for families. There is only one party that's actually taking the time to listen to Ontarians standing up for public ownership of Hydro One, and that is the New Democrats. Remember from East York. Excuse me. I'm sorry. It's clock. Stop the clock. The member from Beaches East York will withdraw. Speaker, withdraw. Please finish. Bills need to stay under control in this province, not get risen because of the sell-off of Hydro One. And we are standing up for the protecting of the money that Hydro One actually brings in each and every year that helps us make investments in Ontario. Will this Premier and her Liberal government stop the sell-off of Hydro One and do right by the people of this province? Question, thank you. Well, Mr. Thank Speaker, the leader of the third party knows that the Ontario Energy Board sets prices now. The Ontario Energy Board will set prices in the future, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. The regulatory regime that is in place will remain in place, Mr. Speaker. So we have made a decision based on the reality that we must invest in infrastructure. We've made a decision based on the reality that no matter what region of this province, whether you go to the north, I was in Sudbury talking to Phnom this week, Mr. Speaker. Every municipality in this province is interested in the provincial government working with them to invest in infrastructure. In the north, that means roads and bridges. In the Greater Toronto-Hamilton area, that means trains, it means public transit, Mr. Speaker, in London, in Ottawa, in Kitchener-Waterloo, in Brantford, it means transit, yes, Mr. Speaker. So we are going to work with those municipalities. It would be great if we had a federal partner working with us, Thank but you. we're going to work with those municipalities. And Thank you. No question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, for five years you chose to risk the lives of Ontarians to save a few bucks on your substandard winter road maintenance contracts. Yep, with the earmuffs on. Five years in which the auditor re revealed continued lax standards meant uncleared roads that were the direct result of your government's flawed cost-cutting contracts. You knew the dangers for years, and yet you did nothing. People died. You failed to act. Actually, all of you know better. Premier, you failed to act and people actually died. Premier, why did you refuse to lift a finger when ministry staff warnings cried out for your action to prevent untimely to winter road deaths? Easier Easier question. Thank you. Premier. Minister of Transportation. Transportation. Thanks uh, very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Kitchener-Conestoga for that question. As I said last week, when the auditor brought forward her report, uh, it contained eight recommendations, Speaker. And as I've said, as the ministry has said in that report, all eight of the auditor's recommendations have been accepted, and we will continue to go forward working on uh, those recommendations, Speaker. But it is important to remember that in 2013, 
the Ministry of Transportation undertook an internal review. Speaker, that was before the uh, Public Accounts Committee asked the auditor uh, to do her work. So in 2013, as a result of the internal review that the ministry undertook, Speaker. The member from Renfrew, second time. The member from uh, Stormont and the member from Lanark, second time. Carry on. Thank you, Speaker. As I said, as, as, uh, as a response to the internal review that we, uh, that we did conduct in 2013, Speaker, over 100 new pieces of equipment have been added, both for Northern Ontario yes, and also for Southern Ontario. Additional materials have been brought forward, additional oversight, Speaker. We'll continue to work Thank hard you. on this matter. Thanks very much. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I will remind the minister that the problems on Ontario roads started in 2009, not 2013. Mm -hmm. Premier, ministry staff repeatedly issued stern, serious warnings for winter road clearing under your new substandard contract regime, but you chose to ignore them. You made calculated decisions to save a few bucks by carrying on with your new substandard winter road clearing contracts, and people lost their lives. Carol Milokovic, the wife and mother of Robert and Daniel, still want answers. The families of Alyssa McEwen and Jessica Chamberlain deserves answers. Premier, you ignored warnings. You've ignored your responsibility to Ontario families. Why are you ignoring the calls for a coroner's inquest into these wrongful deaths? Thank you. Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. As I've, uh, as I've said repeatedly, whenever I hear of a fatality on a highway anywhere in Ontario, whether it takes place in winter or in any, any other season, of course, uh, Speaker, I feel heartfelt uh, sympathy and I offer condolences to the friends and family of anyone who loses their life on an Ontario highway. It's why it is so fundamentally important at the Ministry of Transportation to make sure that we maintain the strong track record that we do have, Speaker. For the last 13 years, Ontario has ranked first or second for highway safety across all of North America. In fact, Speaker, in 2012, in 2012, Speaker, the only other jurisdiction in North America that had a better record was the District of Columbia. Speaker, in 2013, the ministry did conduct the internal review of the winter maintenance program. As a result of that internal review, more equipment has been added, more oversight has been added. We have a, note, a new procurement out in the Kenora area, Speaker. We've accepted all eight of the um, of the uh, auditor's recommendations, and Speaker, Thank I've you. asked the auditor to come in back in next year. Thank you. New question, member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. I was pleased to hear from the Premier of Quebec this morning. I understand Premier regularly speaks with Mr. Couillard. As the Premier knows, a hydro bill in Quebec from Quebec's public hydro agency is about half of a hydro bill in Ontario with our mess of privatization. Remember from and now, Lawrence. before any Ontarians can have their say, the Premier is planning a sell-off of Hydro One, privatizing even more of the system. The lesson is clear. Well-managed public hydro is affordable. Privatized and fractured hydro is expensive and dysfunctional. Can the Premier explain why she doesn't get this? Thank you. Okay. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, first of all, going back to the 2014 budget, we made it very, very clear that we were going to examine all of our assets to see if we could repurpose those assets uh, for uh, infrastructure investments, Mr. Speaker. We've done that, Mr. Speaker. We are moving forward with a plan that will see us broaden the ownership of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. It will not be privatizing. We will have a minimum of 40 percent ownership moving forward. No other uh, entity will be able to own more than 10 percent, Mr. Speaker. And, and speaking of rates, we've said it over and over again, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board decides what the, the rates are going to be. Timmons, James Mr. Speaker, Bay, they decide time. whether it's a municipal utility, whether it's Hydro One, or whether it's a hybrid. There are some utilities now, Mr. Speaker, that have private interest in it. Answer. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board will be strengthened. The Ontario Energy Board will assure that the interests of the public will be maintained. Thank you. Well, Speaker, as you know, majority private ownership means privatized. In 2014, Hydro-Quebec's dividend to the province was $2.5 billion, which is up from $2.2 billion in 2013. But selling Hydro One will cut our dividends. Ed Clark sells, says selling 15% of Hydro One will cost Ontarians $150 million per year. 
and it's only going to cost more money as the Premier sells more. The lesson is clear. Well-managed public hydro puts money into provincial bank accounts so we can invest in the province. Privatized hydro costs the province money. That means less money for the public to invest. Why does the Premier refuse to look at Quebec as a model instead of plowing ahead with their fire sale of Hydro One? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I don't hear the opposition talking about the price of natural gas in Ontario. Mr. Speaker. Two-way conversation is not going to happen. Carry on. I don't hear the critic talk about the price of natural gas in Ontario. Natural gas in Ontario is rated and is regulated by the Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Speaker. Union Gas and Enbridge are 100% private companies, Mr. Speaker, and they are their prices are managed by the Ontario Energy Board. Just as in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, for, Hy for Hydro One or for OPG or for municipally owned utilities, we see reductions in rates that have been applied for. Mr. Speaker, in 2010, Hydro One asked for a rate increase and distribution, sir. received a 9% reduction. OPG asked for a 6.4% increase. They got a 0.8% reduction, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. The Ontario Energy Board is working. Thank you. New question, the member from Etobicoke North. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I would like to highlight the visit of uh, Quebec's Premier, the Honourable Philippe Couillard, a historical event for the legislation of Ontario. My question is for the Minister responsible for Francophone. 2015 is essential for our province. We have Not only do we have the Pan American Games, but we also have 400 years of Francophone presence in Ontario. The minister said that we would have $1.4 million for different uh, community programs uh, to celebrate the francophone presence in Ontario. We are getting ready to celebrate the francophone presence in Ontario. Could the minister give us an overview of the 62 projects that are in the works for this celebration. The Minister. First of all, I would like to thank the member for Etobicoke North for his excellent question. Mr. Speaker, it is in last September in Sudbury that the Premier announced a subvention of $5.9 million to help projects celebrating the 400th anniversary of Francophone presence in Ontario. I can't wait for these celebrations, be it for cultural, touristic, or other events. I know that on Friday we will see the launch of, uh, of a new program. There is also the Franco celebration in, um, in Toronto. The celebration started this month and will end in October. Francophones and Francophiles invite all Ontarians to come and celebrate with us as well as our friends across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her answer. I am one of 14 members in the government speaking French, and I am proud to see that we celebrate the historical presence of Francophone in Ontario. Samuel de Champlain, until today. It is great to celebrate this event, but could the Minister give us an overview of the long-term investment that we will do in, in, in order to make sure that the Franklin community flourishes in Ontario. The Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are talking here of one, more than one million Francophones in Ontario who use French in their homes. We have a lot of students as well, and 190 million students in French immersion. We have a hundred new schools that have been built and the creation of six entities working for French in our institutions. We have also the creation of the Commissioner for Francophone Services. We have 6% of Francophone immigration in, immigration in Ontario. We are proud of our investment, Mr. Speaker, and I also want to add that the legal system operating in both languages 
happened thanks to one of our ministers, my predecessor of the Conservative Party, who established this nice initiative. So I would like today to thank him. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Energy. Uh, local mayors, plant managers, and I read the Riot Act to Hydro One about unreliable electricity. Two companies in my riding have had more than seven outages already. This year alone, every one of them costing over $50,000 in lost time and products. One plant's lost production now totals over $1 million. Another manager noted his sister plant in South Carolina pays half the per kilowatt hour price for electricity and has just one outage per year. That's your record, Minister. Double the cost, seven, seven times the outages. Seven Yet somehow, Ontario Hydro actually issued a press release last week saying that the, that the issue was fixed. Given the facts, you know that's not true. So why don't you just tell Hydro to stop spinning Thank and you. start fixing the problem? Minister. Mr. Speaker, um, Hydro uh, continues to invest in infrastructure, uh, Hydro One particularly, uh, and uh, we also have to remind people that there are 77 LDCs, local ut utilities across the province, who are responsible for uh, maintaining and providing the service. The member from Bruce Gray, uh, when it comes to Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, they have regional plans, they have regional consultations, and they have regional budgets to deal with these particular issues. There are circumstances, Mr. Speaker, where we do see some uh, some failure of the system. Uh, in fact, they've been brought to my attention by members of the opposition, and I've arranged meetings with Hydro One, senior people, and we're working on resolving those particular issues, Mr. Speaker. But across the board, Hydro One is one of the most reliable companies in North America, Mr. Speaker. It has been recognized as such as one of yes, the sir. top five, and their service uh, in terms of the infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, is extremely reliable. Nope. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Back from the Minister. Minister, that release was an insult to the local mayors. It was an insult to those companies who met with Hydro One, and quite frankly, they're furious. It was clear to everyone in that room that the problem is getting worse, not better. Just go ask your staffer. He was sitting at the last meeting we had. You and Hydro remain in the dark. Your broken electricity system hurts our ability to bring new businesses to the riding, threatens our future of plants that we have right now. Hundreds of jobs and millions of dollars of investment hang in the balance. Prismian Cables, Greenfield Ethanol, Goodyear, the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus, local mayors, they're not making this up, Minister. So I, what I'm asking you is, will you drag Hydro One to the table with a directive to fix this problem before it ruins our Eastern Ontario economy? Will you do that, Minister? Minister, Minister uh, our uh, uh, the member should know that we're in a process now of broadening the ownership of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. There will be significant changes. Stop the clock. Can you uh, take your uh, earpiece uh, off the mic? Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, we expect the new Hydro One with broadened ownership to have uh, a board of directors that is uh, more uh, experienced in business than perhaps the one we have now. We're going to be making changes that will make a difference. But, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Hydro One responds to those areas that have service problems. They, they put additional attention to them if they're brought to my attention, and the member knows He's brought matters to my attention. We've been dealing with them. Other members have done so as well, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Hydro One will be a better company, and Hydro One will provide service that is responsible. And, Mr. Speaker, the rates and the industrial sector are not preventing any. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Premier. The Premier promised that personal support workers would be getting a raise. They promised to raise PSW wages $1.50 last year, $1.50 this year, and $1 next year, for a total of $4 an hour increase. The message was clear and simple. If elected, the Liberal government would be raising PSW wages 
by $4 an hour. Less than a year later, the government has delayed the pay increase to PSW indefinitely. Oh. My question is simple. What happened? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I want to say that I'm proud to be a member of a party and a government that has made such an important commitment. We recognize that our PSWs were undervalued and underpaid, Mr. Speaker, and we've gone through a great effort to remedy that situation and provide into place actually uh, many other measures, Mr. Speaker, that will help to ensure the sustainability of that important health care profession. Mr. Speaker, we've already increased last year the wages of our PSWs in home and community care by $1.50 an hour. We've made the commitment to do the same this year. The member opposite knows, and we've already stated that that increase will be retroactive to April 1st of this, of this year. And Mr. Speaker, we're, frankly, the reason why we're still working at this is we want to get this 100 percent right. We're working with all our partners, the PSWs, yes. those that represent them, the, uh, the service providers, our LINs and CCACs, yes, and we're going to be able to move forward as we commit to Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. PSW provide services to some of the most vulnerable Ontarians. Yes, they, they deserve to be treated with respect. All of them deserve respect. Yes. Speaker, right now, it looks like one more example of Liberals saying one thing but quietly doing something completely different. There's lots of PSWs that are watching this morning. Can the Premier or the Minister tell them when will they be getting the promise raised? Well, they're going to be getting that increase, that second increase of $1.50 very, very soon, Mr. Speaker. It's going to be retroactive to yeah. April 1st. And I want to remind the member and her party as well that they voted against that $4 increase to our PSWs. It's a commitment that we made. We made it in our budget, Mr. Speaker. We put it in our platform as well. We're committed to seeing it through the $4 over three years. In addition to that, we're increasing the minimum wage for our PSWs to a, a, a base of $16.50 an hour. We're we're doing this, Mr. Speaker, because we recognize that our PSWs provide such important care to Ontarians right across this province. We want to make sure they're valued. We want to make sure that their profession is recognized and appreciated. We want to make sure that we're providing them with the training to create a sustainable workforce yes, as well. Yep. We're doing all of those things. We're following through with that commitment of a $4 increase, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question, the member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Today kicks off National Nursing Week in Canada. Nurses play such a valuable and important role in our health care system here in Ontario. I've been a proud registered nurse for over 30 years. We, as nurses, are the most trusted profession in Ontario, and I know that my nursing colleagues continue to be there for people when they're at their most fragile and vulnerable. Nurses care for them, comfort them, they are a lifeline, and sometimes they're the last friendly face a patient will see before they pass away. This was certainly my experience as a nurse. The influence and impact that nurses have on patients and this province can't be quantified or measured because they give so much of themselves in their work. The theme for this year's Nursing Week is Nurses, with you every step of the way. Question. Through you, Speaker, Minister. What is our government doing to support our hard-working nurses in Ontario? Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I couldn't have said it better myself. I want to thank the uh, member from Cambridge for this important question. But even more than that, I want to thank her as she's a nurse and she understands the important role that our nurses uh, do around this province every single day. So happy Nursing Week. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we know. Let me take the opportunity as well on behalf of, I think, all of us, but certainly this caucus over here and myself as Minister of Health, to thank our nurses for the incredible work they do, the frontline work they do, whether that's working in home and community care, Mr. Speaker, or in our hospital ERs or intensive care units, in our public health units. Our nurses are performing such exceptional service to this province. They do it often silently. They do it without, often without recognition, Mr. Speaker, but they need to know that we appreciate the hard work that they do for us and I will and I will Answer. I look forward on the uh, on the supplementary mr. speaker to elaborating uh, more in terms of some of the specific measures we've thank taken. you Excellent. thank you speaker and I thank the minister for his dedication to the nurses in Ontario 
I know that in February, the Minister and the Premier reconfirmed the government's commitment to move forward with a plan to expand the role of registered nurses to include prescribing drugs. I know this is great news for the nurses and the patients in Ontario. While I was working in the emergency room at Cambridge Memorial Hospital, the role of the nurse expanded to carry out medical directives when certain conditions existed, such as ordering some lab and x-ray tests and administering some medications without a direct doctor's order, contributing to reducing ER wait times. The addition of nurse practitioners into our hospitals allows Cambridge residents with minor ailments to be treated more quickly. As a care coordinator for CCAC, I work closely with nurse practitioners Russia. and saw firsthand the valuable role they play. Through you, Speaker, can the minister inform the House of how he's recognizing National thank Nursing you. Week this year? Minister. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you again to the member of Cambridge for this uh, supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, our government's investments have helped to ensure that there is a stable nursing workforce now and for the future. Since taking office in 2003, our government has added more than 24,000 new nurses working wow. in Ontario, and there are currently over 135,000 nurses employed in 2014. Mr. Speaker, our government has also focused on increasing the percentage of nurses who are working full-time, and I'm pleased to say that that percentage has increased by 14 per cent since 2003. We've expanded services offered by nurse practitioners, allowing them enabling them to improve patient care by providing services such as admitting and discharging patients from hospitals, ordering laboratory tests, and prescribing medication. And nurse practitioners will also be able to refer patients directly to specialists. Answer. Today I'm going to Women's College Hospital for an announcement where I will also have the chance to meet with nurses for National Nursing Week in Thank Canada. You. Thank you, Mr. Right. Speaker. The question the member from Huron, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The Chesley Restorative Care Unit Minister is a success story, but despite its success in providing tra transitional care for over 300 patients, mostly seniors, you're choosing to close it. And despite of its support of patients as they transition into home care, which is a focus of your ministry, you're turning a deaf ear. And despite its success in reducing return visits to emergency units throughout our area, the most costly form of care, the savings that are realized by the restorative care unit is being ignored. So, Minister, no matter what numbers you throw around and no, ma no matter how you spin it, back home we know the truth, and that is you have turned your backs on rural Ontarians in my area and you refused funds of to make the restorative Question. care unit in Chesley be extended. So, Minister, will you, once and for all, Come to my area, Thank come you. to Huron Bruce, and visit this restorative care unit. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I understand the member opposite. Uh, she's a great advocate for her community. I have no doubt about that. And but she needs to understand that this pilot project, this important pilot project, that's what it is, that the South Bruce Gray Health Centre had announced themselves that the restoratory care unit at their Chesley site was to close in May. But I think she also knows by now, I would hope, that I asked the Lynn to press the pause button on the closure to ensure that the best decision could be made for the community. And the Lynn has been working with the hospital to ensure that this wouldn't happen without proper community consultation. And in fact, the Lynn is leading the process of working with the relevant uh, operators in the area to develop a long-term plan, Mr. Speaker. There's an open board meeting of the hospital that took place at the end of April. I understand that that's, this has allowed the community to have more time to uh, contribute to the issue. And I also understand that the hospital agreed that they would, uh, the program would continue to allow this review process and consultation Thank to you. happen, Mr. Speaker. Thank yeah, you. Like Supplementary. The member from Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. You recently announced $150 million to create 69 more silos of bureaucracy in our health care system. Your government also recently dumped $30 million for administration to cover its SAMS mess. And you blew $7 million on consultants to tell you how to conduct a fire sale of Hydro One. But when it comes to our health care, you cannot find money for its constituents in Huron Bruce and Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Minister, how is it that your government can find money to cover partisan liberal boondoggles, but not when it comes to keeping restorative care services in our Chesley Hospital? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, the member, I hope you know that the health links that you're talking about, are, they already exist. 
Yeah. And they, they have been lauded, quite frankly, around the world for the focus that they pay to the most complex patients in our community. So they allow a team-based approach to actually provide this care. But to get back to Chesley and the restorative care unit, uh, if, the, if the member opposite didn't hear uh, in the first part of my answer, uh, despite the, the fact that the hospital made the decision on their own to close the unit early a number of months ago, I asked the Lynn to step in and for the hospital to not move forward with that decision. We put a review process in place. We've got a substantial consultation with the community. In fact, the ministry implored the hospital when they, had, they were going to continue with the closing Answer. May 1st. We implored them to keep it open so we could engage in this review process. We we're doing that. I think that we'll have an Thank answer you. which is suitable to the community, Mr. Speaker. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, as of this morning, nearly 900,000 kids across the province are being impacted by the Premier's neglect and underfunding of the education system. Our schools are in chaos, and the Premier and her minister hold ultimate responsibility. Contrary to Liberal spin, this government has already made a $250 million cut to education. And internal documents show a plan to cut about $500 million more over the next three, hundred, three years. Why is this Premier fa forcing students and families to pay the price for her government's wrong choices and misplaced priorities? <laughs> Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, once again, $22.5 billion equals $22.5 billion. That's not a cut. But they do seem to be quite fixated on the results at the end of last year, where my ministry so showed a $248 million savings. Yep. Let me tell you where the savings came from. The savings came because there were less students enrolled in our 72 right. school boards than the boards had uh, uh, originally projected. That led to some in-year savings last year, Remember from which Windsor we West. reinvested this year, which gives us higher per-pupil spending this year. Part of that savings come, came from administrative spending at my ministry. It had absolutely nothing Answer. to do with France. I will have more to say in the supplementary with Thank great you. delight. Supplementary. Oh. The facts speak for themselves, Speaker. $6 million cut from special education, 88 neighbourhood schools closed, more than 2,000 childcare spaces in Toronto on the chopping block, 115 teachers in Peterborough fired, 260 jobs in the TDSB, including 50 special education staff and 100 ESL teachers cut. And now it appears that the Liberals are flip-flopping on their commitment to keep class sizes low with caps. When will the Premier take responsibility for throwing our schools into chaos? Uh, actually, Spec Ed has gone up $1.1 billion since 2003 and did not get cut this year. But to go back to this $250 million they're really concerned about, do you know what happened? School board reserves are Member from Kitchener, Waterloo. On provincial books because we supply all the funding. Do you know what? The school boards had more money left over and put in reserves than we projected, so it got consolidated onto our books. And in addition, money that we had promised for capital for new schools, new additions, and new child care spaces, the people that the money was promised to hadn't spent it yet. So we're, we'll spend it in the future, but we didn't spend it last year. And you know what? They campaigned on finding more safe. Thank you. Your question, the member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation and concerns great news about an agency under his direction. As the member of Beaches East York, I know that many of the people living in my community use public transit on a daily basis. Transit is a key component of their everyday life, and for many, Metrolinx is an important part of their daily commute. Just a few months ago, the Speaker, the Minister and I, along with representatives from TTC and Metrolinx, had an important pilot project announcement about coordinated fares in my riding at the Danforth main station. Now, this is why, Speaker, I was very interested to hear last week that Metrolinx has received special recognition for their exceptional service to Ontario. 
Speaker, will the minister please provide members of this House with more information on the recognition that was recently received by Metrolinx? Question. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I want to begin by thanking the member for Beaches East York for his hard work and for his tenacity on behalf of his community, Speaker. As the Minister of Transportation, it's one of my core responsibilities to work closely with Metrolinx to de develop and implement an integrated transit and transportation system right across the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Speaker, our government continues to work in close partnership with Metrolinx to develop long-term solutions for gridlock and transit that will help manage congestion, connect people to jobs, and improve our economy. That's why I was very pleased to report, I am very pleased to report, that Metrolinx has been recognized as one of Canada's top employers for young people for the third consecutive year, Speaker. This competition, this competition is part of the Canada top, Canada's Top 100 Employers Project, which seeks to recognize community leaders who have effectively attracted and retained younger employees to their organization. Speaker, I want to congratulate the Chair of the Board, Rob Pritchard, President yes, and CEO, Bruce McQuaig, and the entire Metrolinx team for this honour. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for his response and particularly for the great work that he is doing to help build Ontario to expand the transit options in the province of Ontario. Now, there are many young people living in my community, which is why I was so very pleased to hear that Metrolinx has been recognized as one of Canada's top employers for young people for the third consecutive year. And, Mr. Speaker, on so many occasions, we've heard the minister tell the members of this House that there are over $16 billion worth of transit expansion projects currently underway in the Greater Toronto-Hamilton area, and since 200, 2003, we have invested over $22 billion for public transit in Ontario, including approximately $10.8 billion in GO Transit. Now, Mr. Speaker, I know that those living in my community would be interested in hearing more about the projects that are currently underway. So, Speaker, Question. Speaker will the minister please tell the members of this House about those critical transit investments that Metrolink is building in the region and especially affecting my constituents? Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. And again, I thank that member for his question. As I often say in this House, Speaker, very proud to be a member of a government that continues to invest in critical transit and transportation infrastructure initiatives across the province. And of course, Metrolinx is a key partner in delivering on these important transit projects. For example, Speaker, projects like GO Regional Express Rail, which will give those living throughout the GTHA new travel options with faster and more frequent GO Rail service and electrification of core elements or core segments of the GO Rail network. Speaker, projects like the Union Pearson Express which will provide passengers with predictable and reliable service to and from the airport while reducing congestion on our roads, the UP Express coming into service on June the 6th, Speaker, wow. and projects like the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, Speaker, which is the single largest transit expansion project in Ontario's history and will provide yes, tremendous environmental projects and benefits to our region. Speaker, this is only some of what we have underway. Again, I thank that member and I congratulate New question, the member from Perth, Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the uh, Minister of Energy. Uh, Speaker, during a stop in Perth, Wellington, he is quoted as saying, when we look at some of the bills coming in, we say this is unacceptable. Yeah. I want to congratulate the minister for his honesty. We and we agree, skyrocketing hydro bills are unacceptable. Could the minister tell us under whose watch since 2003 did hydro bills rise to such unacceptable levels? Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased that he, rose, he raised that particular issue. The context in which I was saying it, Mr. Speaker, was the fact that throughout rural Ontario, there's a lot of electric, electric uh, uh, heating, and uh, during difficult winters. They create a real burden. Mr. Speaker, that is a legacy that's been on through different governments, Mr. Speaker. The reality is we are taking an initiative, Mr. Speaker. The member from Prince Edward Hastings, second time. The member from um, Renfrew, Nipah, St. Pembroke is warned. Speaker, the rest of the article, which indicated for the first time any government in Ontario is going to undertake to infrastructure, part of the funds which will come from the uh, broadening the ownership of hydro, an initiative to bring more natural gas to rural communities, Mr. Speaker. It's a very, very significant initiative.
the Minister of Agriculture, Rural uh, Food and Rural Affairs come to order, and the member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the minister came to Strat. Finish, please. Uh, Speaker, uh, the minister came to Stratford and finally admitted there's a problem. After years of telling us there's no problem, and now he's blaming a previous government from over a decade ago, and he expects anyone to believe him. My constituents aren't falling for it. The fact is, many of them can't afford their hydro bills. Two weeks ago, on peak hydro, on peak hydro costs spiked another 15 percent, with no end in sight. The only thing more unacceptable than our hydro bills is this stunning arrogance of this government. Minister, what are you waiting for? Will you finally take some responsibility for your own unacceptable policies? Mr. Speaker, first of all, uh, there are three other provinces that have higher electricity bills in Ontario. Two, Manitoba and Quebec have significantly lower than all the other provinces. Mr. Speaker, what I was addressing was a significant issue in rural areas which has been there for decades. During cold winters, on electric heat, it becomes very, very difficult. Mr. Speaker, we have in our budget Member we for Bruce Gray, program, Sound. which we're rolling out, Mr. Speaker, to bring more natural gas service to the rural areas, an initiative we're proud of, an initiative that government never even thought of. Question the member from Welland. Ten-year anniversary of the legislature's unanimous passing of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. It mandated the government to ensure Ontario be fully accessible and barrier-free by two? 2025. To the Premier, the Liberals' own independent review concluded that 10 years later it has failed 1.8 million Ontarians with disabilities through non-compliance and lack of enforcement. The Premier pro promised that Ontario would be on schedule when she was running as leader of her party, but AODA enforcement is down, cut in half in 2015. Will the Premier admit that her government has failed Ontarians with disabilities and commit to increasing AODA audits in both public and private sectors? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's a, that's, a, that's a good question. I actually welcome the question. Uh, we have seen our, our compliance go up, Mr. Speaker, over the last 24 months from 16 per cent to 40 per cent. Good increase, but not good enough as far as we're concerned. Mr. Speaker, we're, we're, now, we're now coming up to our 10th year anniversary of the AODA. What a great time, Mr. Speaker, to celebrate how far we've come, because we are number one in the world when it comes to, to making headway on accessibility and when it comes to having legislated requirements. We're the only province that has that right now. So we're number one in the world for that, but would also a great time to assess how far we've come and how far we have to go and, and, the, and the measures we'll need to take over the next 10 years to reach our goal of full accessibility. So I welcome the members' input. We will continue to work to improve compliance. We'll continue to work to ensure that people with disabilities get hired throughout our, our employment system Answer. in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we've, got, we've come a long way. We've got a long way to go, and it's something we're very excited about tackling. The time for question period is over. Point of order. The member. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, recognize Yvonne Spicer, Gordon Kyle, Chris Beasley, and Roy O'Leary from the Community Living Ontario. Welcome to the Legislature. Thank you. Point of order. Member from uh, the member from Welland. Introduce uh, Carrie Thomas, David Middleton, and Dale Sheets from the Welland Pelham Community Living. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I would like to correct what I said. I was talking about a judicial system operating in two languages, and that was an initiative of Attorney General Roy McMurtry. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome. Uh, Merrick Golden as well to the legislature today, and I know you'll be joining me in a few minutes outside, Speaker, for the Europe Day flag-raising event. We'd like to welcome everyone who's uh, participating in that event. Thank you. I would like to introduce Mary Cruden. She's president of Canadian Parents for French. She's with us today. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.